It's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome everyone to our fall 2015 Honors Lecture Series on Veterans. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize our Dean, Dr. John Vile, who's with us today. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to you um, one of the most intelligent and most of, one of the most widely read people I know in the world. Um, Mr. Donald H. Whitfield is a graduate of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, and he's the Vice President for Community and National Programs at the Great Books Foundation in Chicago, where he creates and administers outreach programs in the humanities. Over the years, he has edited over 20 anthologies for the Great Books Foundation in support of reading groups throughout the country, including our very own Great Books in Middle Tennessee Prisons program here at MTSU. He's also been a very strong supporter of our prison program, and in addition to participating in the lecture series today, he'll be here tomorrow to conduct a shared inquiry workshop for the volunteers in our program and for people who are interested in uh, working in the prisons. Mr. Whitfield is also an Army veteran, and most recently the editor of a new book called Standing Down from Warrior to Civilian. His topic today will be Talking Service, a reading and discussion program for veterans. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Whitfield back to the University Honors College. Is that me? Can I live up to all that? <laughs> I've been coming down here for the last three or four years. It's always a pleasure for me to come to Tennessee because of my family originated here before, for some strange reason, they crawled up to Chicago, where they've been ever since. But it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, I work for an organization called the Great Books Foundation. It's based in Chicago. It's about 70 years old. And we're a, we're a nonprofit organization, and we work with people of all ages uh, to create opportunities for the discussion of literature. It's the most general way to put it. Um, not simply as an academic exercise or as a classroom activity, but as a way of uh, uh, creating opportunities for people to probe beneath the surface of great literature. Um, not to talk about the literature, but to talk to, uh, through it and from within it. Uh, we have a lot of programs for, for uh, K-12 students. Were any of you, when you were in grade school five or six, ten years ago, uh, in a program called Junior Great Books? Does that ring a bell for anyone? It's, it's a national program, so a little reading and discussion program that we work with teachers all over the country. I happen to, uh, to work with our adult education programs, so I'm always on the lookout for sectors of the population we might want to work with. I have uh, outreach programs for former prison inmates. I work with uh, self-directed groups in senior centers all over the country. But about three years ago, I became very interested, as a veteran myself, uh, in the link between humanities and uh, activities for veterans. There are many sorts of organizations that have sprung up especially since um, OIF and OEF, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, which some of you may know is uh, the name for the conflict in Afghanistan. And uh, many of the returning veterans have felt the need to continue getting together with their peers and engaging in some sort of activity that is not, strictly speaking, um, a, um, a an ordinary day-to-day -day activity, like uh, figuring out how to fill out forms for the VA or how to find a job or that sort of thing, but to uh, get together with peers, to talk about their experiences, to write about their experiences, to create works of art that are based on their experiences. My bailiwick happens to be 
conducting discussion groups, that is, uh, groups that focus on some reading that everyone has in common, gets together to talk about through a sort of Socratic questioning and answering. That's what I do. I spend a lot of my time leading discussion groups. I'm rarely behind a podium like this. It's not my preferred or even my habitual stance. So I think you have a copy of a poem called Perimeter Watch. Does everybody have that? A little later after I'm done talking, uh, I'm going to do something with that so we have a little more of an interactive situation here. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start out with some sort of an informational sector of what I'm going to say and tell you a little bit about a program that I've been working with for the last uh, two and a half years. It's called Talking Service. And I gave it that name because I wanted to emphasize that it's a program for veterans, for uh, veteran uh, family members of veterans, for caretakers of veterans, for other people who are interested in veterans, to bring them together to talk, of course, to share their experiences, to reflect, to uh, think about where they've been, where they are, and where they want to be, but always using literature, some, some text from the humanities as a focal point, so not just sort of an open discussion situation, but one that has some real focus to it. Um, the genesis of talking service is, is a little indirect. About 10 years ago, I was asked by a friend who was a clinical social worker with a, a hospice in Chicago. She was having trouble getting people to stay in bereavement groups that she ran for, uh, for family members, of those who had passed away. And I naively said, well, have them read something and we'll talk about it, because that's what I do. And so what we did uh, for two, actually three, eight-week sessions with different groups of people is we chose some very short readings that we thought would focus the attention of people who were very, their emotions, their feelings were, were heightened. They were having trouble concentrating. They were having trouble talking with each other in a group, but they certainly wanted to do that. Uh, they, they were self-selecting. They came to the bereavement group because they wanted to be there, but they didn't stick it out. And so we used pieces of literature as the focal point. And it worked like a charm. In fact, the clinical social worker said she knew it was working when the men stayed. They were always the first dropouts. Um, and I think the reason it worked is because sometimes people are uncomfortable when they're in a group reflecting on their most heartfelt experiences, sometimes their most traumatic experiences. But if there's a piece of literature that is related to what's on their minds, that helps them find their own voice, that maybe says something, because it's great literature, better than they could say it, but gives a sort of model about how to talk about something which otherwise would be rather incohate, uh, didn't have a shape for them. But that, there's a real power to that. So a few years ago, when I started thinking about um, putting together a similar program for veterans, I thought, well, that's, that's really the model for it. Use, use short works of literature uh, that have to do with military service and especially have to do with the transition from civilian life into military service and back out again. We do a hell of a good job, some would say, and some would say we don't, but we certainly do a, an efficient job of training inductees into the military to uh, operate the machinery of war, to know how to behave, to fall into rank, to work together in various kinds of units, platoons and so forth. We don't do a very good job at making the transition in the other direction. And because we don't really have a, a large military class in this country, we have a, we have a military establishment of, of career people, but we cycle men and women in and out of the military on a, a fairly brisk schedule in many cases. Uh, as long as, as, long as, uh, as the men and women are in the military, they also have in mind that they're citizens as well. As well. They, they don't put all of that aside. George Washington called uh, armies in a democracy an army of citizen soldiers. So there are certain values, there are certain orientations that everyone in the military does or should keep as long as they're in, in the military and to try to restore themselves to that orientation when they've been in, especially in combat, where they've been asked to do things which you don't do in civil society. You don't kill people uh, if, uh, under the mandate to do so. You don't interrogate people 
uh, in a way to uh, exploit their weakness in order to get very valuable information sometimes. Those aren't values that we extol in civilian society. And to move from operating efficiently in the military back into civilian society with all the disruptions and all the dislocations that that implies, family dislocations, uh, distance from, from children, um, being out of phase with one's peers. One of the one most interesting dynamics I've seen in recent years is between uh, young men and women who have been in the military, and they went in very young, and then they come back and go to college. I mean, uh, uh, is anybody here a veteran? Is, is it? You got one, okay. Um, there's, often, there's often a great disparity in experience between those who didn't go into the military and those who came back. And just because chronologically they're the same age doesn't make much difference. There's a, there's a big, big gap. Uh, another hard transition to make. So uh, what I did with the help from the National Endowment for the Humanities is I started by putting a book together, because I work for the Great Books Foundation, where books. This is an anthology of 44 readings, starting with Homer's Iliad and going up through memoirs by uh, men and women who were uh, in the military in OEF and OIF, that is Iraq and Afghanistan, and much in between. And I chose readings that I thought would not reveal their meaning right away, that weren't obvious, that had many layers that could be discussed, that were often provocative. Uh, people often say to me, do you think this is something we really should put in front of people who have um, experienced very um, uh, difficult situations? And I say, you bet. Uh, because the writers, Hemingway, and Stephen Crane, and many others, have said it so well, and they've said it so powerfully. And again, it's a model for finding one's own voice. What I hear again and again from men and women who are in talking service groups all over the, over the country, and it is a national program, is it's the first time with a group of my peers that I was able, able to tell my own story. How many of you have ever met a veteran and said, thank you for your service? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, OK. That's, that's the commonplace, and it's a nice thing to do. It's, it's, it's uh, courteous, and it's respectful. It's probably not the right thing to say. Try saying, tell me a story. Every veteran has a story, and it's the hardest thing to do. Um, sometimes there's a, a kind of presumption that uh, if you've experienced something and somebody else hasn't, I mean, this is just in general, uh, you can't speak to the other person about it. They have to have had that experience. I think that's bogus, but it's uh, easy to understand the, the sentiment. Um, in talking service, we generally bring together groups of peers, that is, groups of men and women who have been in the military who talk with each other. And they've shared those experiences, and they often feel, we often feel, I put myself in this class as a veteran, often feel more comfortable with those who we know share some of our own experiences. They certainly share the experience of the discipline of the military and sometimes other kinds of experiences as well. But we hope in talking service, others will be drawn in as well, and not only to eavesdrop on a conversation among people who have a lot in common, but to uh, understand and to engage in a kind of dialogue. Uh, I like to think of talking service as not a parochial program that sort of categorizes veterans as a separate species of humanity. I think that's a mistake. It's, uh, talking service is intended to raise a lot of questions for all of us, whatever our political orientation might be, whatever our assumptions might be about how we deploy our human and our military, our material resources, and what the values are that lie behind those deployments. No presumptions about what those values might be, but it's a, it's a forum in which to investigate those values. And we do that through the lens of thinking about military service, thinking about what it means to be in combat and what it means to make the transitions back again. Um, I'd like to read you just a little something. This is from, I won't tell you who it's from, I'll tell you afterwards. Although I used this in a discussion group once and uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said, did X author write anything else? Because I've got to read more, this is important to me. Uh, this is a story, it's very brief, it's called Soldier's Home. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, uh, take too much time, but it's worth reading if you can look it up. 
uh, the scenario is a, a young uh, man who's returned home to a small town somewhere in middle America after World War I. He's gotten home a little later than the other troops for some logistical reasons of transporting troops back. And this is a description of, uh, of how he feels about being at home. There, there's a mention of some uh, battles here that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, Below Wood, Soissons, the Champ uh, Champagne, San Miguel, and the Argonne. Those are some of the fiercest battles toward the end of the war that Americans were deeply involved in. Because remember, America did not enter the war until 1917, not long before the end in 1918. And this is what Krebs, the protagonist, is thinking, according to this author. At first, Krebs, who had been at Below Wood, Soissons, the Champagne, San Miguel, and in the Argonne, did not want to talk about the war at all. Later, he felt the need to talk, but no one wanted to hear about it. His town had heard too many atrocity stories to be thrilled by actualities. Krebs found that to be listened to at all, he had to lie. And after he had done this twice, he too had a reaction against the war and against talking about it. A distaste for everything that had happened to him in the war set in because of the lies he had told. All of the times uh, that had been able to make him feel cool and clear inside himself when he thought of them, the time so long back when he had done the one thing, the only thing for a man to do, easily and naturally, when he might have done something else, now lost their cool, valuable quality and then were lost themselves. His lies were quite unimportant lies and consisted in attributing to himself things other men had seen, done, or heard of, stating as facts, certain apocryphal incidents familiar to all soldiers. It goes on a little later. Krebs acquired the nausea in regard to experience that is the result of untruth or exaggeration. And when he occasionally met another man who had really been a soldier, and they talked a few minutes in the dressing room at a dance hall, uh, he fell into the easy pose of the old soldier among other soldiers uh, that he had been badly, sickeningly frightened all the time. In this way, he lost everything. That's Hemingway, um, who was in World War I briefly. But I think, it, I think it's a really good description of the dynamic of uh, thinking that you can only communicate with others who would sh share the same experience. And when the story is, is the centerpiece of some of our discussions, it really it goes on. And it, it's a complex story. It's only seven pages long, but it is Hemingway. Um, and it examines the relation of this, this young man to his mother, to his father, uh, to the girls who were left behind, who he's come back to, to his interest in making his way in the world. And it's really a powerful lens. It's powerful also because it's about a war that happened uh, 100 years ago, really. And it points out to those who are reading it here and now that there are some perennial issues that are never lost. Get back to another reading, I won't do it, but it's Homer, the Iliad. Some of you may have read it. There's a point where the hero of the Trojans goes back uh, into the walls. It's sort of an R&R. &R. He's back for a short respite from the battle. And he's wearing his Greek helmet with lots of feathers, and it, it covers his face, and it's rather gruesome. And he confronts his wife and child, and the child is terrified of him because he doesn't recognize Daddy. Daddy's been at war, and Daddy's back now, and Daddy looks like a monstrosity. It's literally true because he's wearing armor, but the symbolic quality of that is so powerful. The idea that being in a military stance somehow changes the whole aspect of someone who should be in the closest bond possible to another human being, a father and son or a mother and child. Uh, so the distance of some of the readings that we use in the discussion groups actually works to their advantage. I think instead of um, emphasizing how strange and far away the experiences being described are, it brings it closer because the readings talk about something which is perennial and human in all times and places. I want to read you something else briefly. This is from the foreword to Standing Down. It's written by a... Um, OIF veteran named Ben Bush, who's a sort of a Renaissance man. He paints, he draws, he went to Vassar. In fact, he tells a story in his memoirs that when he was um, in the Marines in one of the first lineups, the uh, sergeant at arms uh, saw his credentials and said, 
uh, Vassar, that's a girl's school. And he said, that's a women's school, sir. <laughs> ben, is, ben is spunky, but a uh, decorated combat veteran. Um, standing down, it's the title, it says, the words stand down are in opposition to one another, an oxymoron like good war and friendly fire. The term was first used as an order uh, to the court witness who stood to give testimony and when finished would step down from the stand. It appeared in military commands during World War I when troops in deep trenches ascended on fire steps to look out and engage charging Germans. They would stand too on alert and stand down to rest out of sight. Uh, trench poet Wilfred Owen wrote while standing down, uh, it is understood that warriors released from service have been ordered to stand down for the rest of their lives, but they cannot begin again as civilians as if just waking from a sleep. It is difficult for some of us veterans to remember that we were like what we were like before the wars. Our stories from the front echo in who we have become. And he goes on here uh, to quote an author. Some of you may have read Tim O'Brien. Anybody has read The Things They Carried? Yeah his uh, uh, sort of creative nonfiction about his experiences in Vietnam. And he says, Tim O'Brien says, and Ben Bush is quoting him, a true war story is never moral. It does not instruct nor encourage virtue nor suggest models of proper human behavior nor restrain men from doing the things men have always done. If a story seems moral, do not believe it. If at the end of a war story where you feel uplifted or if you feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste, then you've been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie. And I think he's getting at the complexity of capturing the experience of being in the military and in combat in, in literature. Um, it's not there to teach an easy lesson, but it's there to depict and capture the complexity of the situation. And that's what we try to, to emphasize. Um, I really haven't said much about what actually happens in talking service. We get together. I, I work through state humanities councils all over the country. They're a good in infrastructure because they have tentacles out into, obviously, their, their states. Tennessee happens to be one of the states that is sponsoring talking service at a number of sites to be determined. They're, they're sort of new to the program. Um, but we find host sites who are willing to, who feel that they can draw in groups of veterans for discussions of literature. And then we train facilitators to lead the discussions. The facilitators are not instructors, they're not teachers even. Um, many are, are people who have been in the military, but not all. But uh, the primary skill is to ask good questions about the, the reading, to draw the participants out. It's the old Platonic model. Some of you have read Plato's Republic, and in Book 7, it says true education takes place, paraphrasing, true education takes place when you draw insights out of the learners, not when you put content into them. That's didactic teaching. That's for another purpose. But what we do in all of our discussion activities, whether it's talking service or, or any others, even our programs with little kids in school, is we ask a lot of questions. And the facilitator doesn't teach, doesn't offer opinions particularly, which is maddening to those of us who are doing it and have opinions. But we restrain ourselves and bite our tongue to the root and talk afterwards. But we ask a lot of questions. We, we listen to the responses. We try to weave those together. We ask more questions. On the premise that a quest, that, that answer to a question is not meant to get rid of the question. It's meant to enrich the ways in which we can respond to the question. If it gets rid of the question, it's probably a factual question, like what day is it today? But if it's a real question with some meat to it, some depth, then the answers are responses, and they enrich the question. And the question never really goes away. It just becomes more interesting, hopefully. And that's the approach that we take in these discussion groups. It's an amateurish approach in the sense that it's, it's done out of great love for the interaction between people and ideas. That's what amateur means. It means somebody who loves what they do. Um, it's not an academic exercise. I always say when I first meet with a group, Many of these works of literature, ones that you may or may not have heard of in school, they were written 
first of all, for general audiences. They weren't written for the classroom. The classroom is a place where you do something else with them, and something that's very valuable and very, very enriching often, but that's not what we do here. Um, that's the gist of talking service. Uh, I work very hard these days to work with the host sites all over the country. There are now about 14, 14 states participating in the program. There'll be more come next year. And it's, I'm linking it up with writing programs. I'll be working with the uh, Charles George uh, Veterans Administration Medical Center in Asheville, North Carolina, starting in January, because they have a mandate from the VA to try to incorporate more humanities programs in veterans' uh, care plans in VA facilities. That's, that's a real breakthrough. It's been a struggle to get entree to them, but uh, we're delighted that that's going to be one of the pilot sites. Um, I wanted to just do something else before I open it up for the conversation. That is this poem you have in front of you, Perimeter Watch. Um, Brian Turner is, I think Brian is in his early 40s. He was, uh, he was in uh, Iraq I think around, nine, around 2004, 5, 6, 7, somewhere in there. And he's written a couple of books of poetry, and he teaches poetry at a college in, uh, in Florida. Uh, highly regarded. This poem I use often uh, in our discussion groups. And I wanted to just try a little, little exercise here. Um, I'm going to read it out loud, and then I'm going to just throw out a couple of questions and just you know, respond as you, as you see fit, and we'll get a little, little discussion going. Okay? Do you mind if I read it? Anybody else want to read it? Any volunteers? Okay. Do you want to read it? Yeah, but you have to be loud. Just the first paragraph? No, the whole thing. For your watch. Project. I lock the doors tonight. Check the bolts twice just to make sure. Turn off all the lights. Only the fan blades rotate above. Slow as helicopters winding down their oily gears. Water buffalo chew the front lawn, snoring. When the sprinklers switch on, white cowbirds lift up from the grass with heavy wing beats. A column of feathers rising over my rooftop. Their wingtips backlit by the moon. Through Venetian blinds, I see the Iraqi prisoners, that dank cell at Firebase Eagle, staring back at me. They say nothing, just as they did in the winter of 2004, shivering in the piss cold dark on scraps of cardboard, staring. Snipers traverse the skyline from the neighbor's rooftop. Helicopters on station, 15 minutes out. And it's difficult to tell the living from the dead, walking the dim elephant grass papyrus thickets lining the asphalt streets. I see Bosch, my own rifleman, sleepwalking, on fire and unaware of it. I see the striker, Ghost 3, parked at the curb. I know the guys inside, watch Iraqi women in the white hot lens of the gun mount camera, eager for the smolder of their sex. A minivan idles with passengers dying inside, while down the street, an explosion sets off the neighbor's car alarm. Then, quiet. The wounded wait with great patience for Doc High, who treats them by the pool in the backyard, where I can see the Turkish cook with shrapnel in the back of his head, his mouth still foaming. Beside him, the dead infant from that cold blue morning in the orange, glo orange groves of Balad, while in the pool, a battalion scout floats face down in the current Where's my M4, my smoke grenades, my flak vest and plates of body armor? I wander the house searching for them, hear the 12-year-old voice just outside the front door. Where is my father? Let free my father. My father, no bad man. Let go my father. When I dial 911, the operator tells me to use proper radio procedure, reminding me that my call sign is Ghost 13 Alpha. And that it's time, long past time, to unlock the door and let these people in. Thank you. A lot of questions about this. Who are these people? <coughs> and why is it time to let them in? But, but who are the people he's talking about at the end of the poem? Anybody? His family, friends, 
Why do you think that? The folks back home? The, the, he's having these, it seems to be he's having these dreams, memories, flashbacks, that what the final paragraph is concluding is that it's time to, to not play, not be so entrenched in the memory that you can't let people around you back into your life. But the, the military mindset is, is, is effectively him shutting out, trying to shut out people close to him. Where where does this where does this story this poem take place? Do you think? In his home. In his home? So why would he? And are you saying that uh, that it's not literally letting them in, but letting them back into his life in some way? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Because he thinks they're the enemy. You mean literally locking literally the door to keep them out? Yeah, like barricade, like you wouldn't know, because he doesn't know what's real and he thinks his family is against him because he doesn't know it's his family. Okay, is that different from what he was saying or is it another version of the same thing? Yeah, it's another version. Another version. I, I took it completely differently. I was thinking more along the lines of acceptance. Um, let these people in, these are the people that he's remembering from his war time, and kind of just accepting them. He's having these dreams about them. Um, not necessarily suppression, but kind of like just dealing with what happened, and he's locking the door. He's not only locking the door to lock himself in, but he's locking the door to keep everything out. And so if he lets these memories just, just accept them kind of thing, he needs to come to terms. Everyone is, you know, all, all three of you, I think, are talking in the same arena, and you've all used terms like inside and outside, and the poem is called Perimeter Watch. What is a perimeter? How, how is it set? Who sets it? The people on the outside? On the inside, okay, and, and why? Keep people out, okay. How do they know where to put the perimeter? Pardon me? And what do they take into consideration in deciding exactly where to put it? Is there some precision to it? Danger? Okay. Okay, so they determine what the margin is for a space to protect things in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, How much they can protect. When does a perimeter that you set change? Is it a, is it a fluid thing or does it remain fixed? It is often fluid, I should imagine, because that will change. Using it in the literal sense of you're trying to keep people out by setting up your fence around your camp. That's going to change depending on who is outside you or still is or has left. That will change also depending on who you still have inside and what needs to be protected. In the metaphorical sense of being in your head, that's going to change depending on who it proves to be trustworthy and who against whom you need not protect yourself any longer. I mean, taking it from that approach, you know, emotional or relationship-wise, then your boundaries change, your perimeters change daily hourly, by conversation, um, whatever you feel like you can disclose to other people, you're changing your boundaries, you're changing that perimeter. Mm -hmm. Is there a change, we don't have a lot of time, we had time to explore this whole thing at great length, but um, is there a change in the scenario that's set out in this poem? You introduced that, that one is evaluating or forming new judgments. Can we see how the speaker here, who starts out by saying, I locked the doors tonight and ends up saying, it's time to let these people in. Do we have any idea from what Brian Turner has given us about why there seems to be a movement from locking out to letting in? Is there something in the experience that's described that gives us a hint to what's going on here? So it may be crucial about how the protagonist moves from one place to another. 
in a way the setting changes. It starts out with him imagining, from, from the way I read it, still being back at his camp, whatever it was called, and looking around and seeing what was around him, making sure that everything was secure for the night. And then in the way that he's thinking about it, or at least the way he describes it, maybe it's a tonal change, but I think it's also a setting change. He describes, it sounds, being back at home and being back in the normal, seemingly non-threatening arena, and yet still thinking as though he has to defend himself against the threat because there can't not be a threat but then he begins to crack just a little bit. Looking at the order of the elements in the poem, why do you think it is that right before he dials 911, 911, however you want to look at it, uh, there's this little quote, where is my father, let free my father, my father, no bad man, let go my father, and then after that he dials 911, and then after that he says it's time to let people in. Is there some connection between those two events? What, what, what could it be? I don't know. I don't know either. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the, it was like the, he locks the bedroom door as a, a child of his was not saying like what, like what, what a child of the speaker. Let me in and I, he was a for, called 911 out of pure fear. So you think it's, you think it's a child of the speaker? Or no? I thought it was a child of someone that he was killing. So I let my dad go. He's, he's good, and he's, I mean, it's his duty to kill him, and I think that haunts him. So then, if, as we were saying, if he's at home, it's, it's a recollection of something. There seems to be a lot of that mixing of memory and mm -hmm. present reality, mm -hmm. which makes for a slightly confusing reading at first, and thus the oddity of looking around the camp and yet just seeing ceiling fan blades, yet then he links it immediately to helicopter rotors, and then to simply being in his house, linked to seeing prison cells, walking around the rest of the world, linked to seeing people lying dead in a pool or on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not, using the word linked, it sounds like you're saying there are associations that link one thing to another. Yeah, please. Um, just speaking out of experience with veterans, I have a lot of vets in my family, and I know a lot of vets. Um, children happen to have a certain effect on people in general, and I have a feeling, just the feeling that I got from this, he says, where is my father, let my father, like a child begging for somebody that you've identified as the enemy, but now he's personalized as a person, this is a father of someone, this person has a life, and though we've identified him as an enemy, it kind of personalizes that, um, and so him realizing that these are people I'm going to call 911 and then calling 911 and he still no you need to use um, your call sign it puts him back in that place as a soldier and so he's just realizing these conflicting emotions and these conflicting thoughts would you say would you say then that the poem resolves is a is a description of something being resolved I don't know that it's a resolution but I think it's more of a a step forward or a step away from an, an ideal or frame of mind into... But, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. I see it as sort of part of a progression. You, you start and there's all these things happening outside of the house, yeah. but he never interacts with them. There's no, like, he sees it happening, but he doesn't really take it in. And then when you get to the 12-year-old boy outside the door, then that's another step where it's actually a voice, it's actually communication. Mm -hmm. And then he realizes it's time to let people in, but from that realization, there's kind of the implication that, well, once he does that, then he's got to deal with all of the things that are outside. And did he, did he arrive at that point that you're describing through his own volition, or did it just, you were, the fellow behind you was saying, was talking about one thing being linked to another and sort of a, you would say, a progression of associations, but does the speaker have any control over what's happening here, or is it just a lucky happening that he reaches this point where he realizes that he needs to let people in? Another way to ask that is, is the ending of this optimistic, or is it just neutral? I would say it's more neutral and almost resigned than anything else. Um, it is saying I need to unlock the door, but he's saying that 
I've waited so long to do this, um, and I need to move forward. It's, I wouldn't call it optimistic. If, if you were listening to this man read yeah. this, I feel like it would be more of a kind of sad and resigned and just kind of like, this is, it's time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sounds scared. Sounds scared. The writing itself is really passive, too. It doesn't say, I decided to let these people in. It says, um, reminding me once again that it's time, long past time, really. It's not that he comes to the, the decision. It's that some outside factor is reminding him that he needs to do it. So like Michaela said, it feels very resigned, kind of passive, like, well, I, I guess I need to do it, as opposed to, I have to do this. And we don't really know what he might do. It's a little unresolved. That's the kind of thing we do in talking service, but we do it for about an hour and a half. And uh, many times when I've led discussions of this, veterans who have been on this kind of operation that's described here said to me, well, this describes exactly the scenario where you're at home base, you go out, there's a, a firefight of some sort, a lot of damage is done, there are casualties, and then you go back and uh, you've taken some, uh, some prisoners and you interrogate them and so forth. So there is a, a little bit of a dramatic scenario here that um, I've, it's been pointed out in discussions. But we use all sorts of readings. Um, we use prose, we use memoirs, we use a lot of poetry because, it's, because of its compression. Um, but I thought it might be interesting just to show you what it looks like in practice, which is um, it's, a very, it's a very simple activity in some ways, but it requires the, the discussion leader to just keep asking questions and listening to what everyone's saying. Is there anything more you'd like to know about talking service or about our work with it? I, I've been working with it for about two years. Anything? Yeah, uh, you and then you. Uh, I'm just curious, is uh, Eugene Sledge's book with the old breed uh, part of the no, and, and uh, it isn't. There, I couldn't find a good way to excerpt that. Sometimes with longer works, it's a little tricky. But uh, we have a reading list, and we recommend some of these things, and that's certainly on it. Yeah. What typical size is a uh, bird? Uh, 12 to 15, something like that. So everyone has a chance to talk. Some of the most talkative groups I've ever led discussions with. Um, more than that, there's always somebody who's going to dominate the group, and then you get caught up in group dynamics that aren't always productive. So we like to keep the groups fairly small. Yeah. So can I sign you up to be volunteers in talking service? I was just told 5% of your population on campus is veteran population. Is that right, Hillary? We have a program called Writers' Corps. And um, no, Dr. Ritchie works a lot in that, really speaking. It, um, it has a lot of the similar kind of practices, except they're writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the link. Yeah, the link between reading and discussing and writing is, of course, a strong one. And and uh, often at the end of our discussions, there are a lot of a lot of questions still hanging, and that's probably as it should be. And I would love to link some of the programs to a writing program, too, because those are the places often to start writing, because they're ideas that have been generated from the group. I think in both ways, at a writing where you're able to move um, from subjective to objective and then start looking at your situation a little bit further. Yeah, absolutely. And even imitating the, the writers who have been read. They're good models. What is your favorite thing that you've read recently in this genre? Oh, well, longer works, probably. Uh, Phil Kly's book of short stories called uh, De Deployment. And his publisher used the same cover photo as we did, but we, and I'm, you know, we're flattered. It's, it's, it's a stock photo that you get from a, a, an image base you rent, you pay a permission fee. But it's exactly the same picture. It came out about six months after this book, and I'm delighted. It's a wonderful book. Phil, K-L-A-Y, it's pronounced Cly. You might have seen this. It's excellent. And Ben Bush's memoir, Dust to Dust, I read you a little of his uh, foreword to the book. Uh, it's not all about his military service, but that weaves in and out of it. And he's a, he's a superb writer. He's good. And he's, he's in here, too. 
And she had been, she had been Fallon. She had been Fallon uh, was not herself in the military. Her husband was, and she was at Fort Hood. She was on the home front. And she wrote a wonderful and harrowing book of stories called You Can Tell When the Men Are Gone. And it has very much to do with, obviously, family relations and very much from a woman's point of view, what it means to try to um, reconstitute families when, uh, when men come back. She had been S-I-O-B-H-A-N, Fallon, F-A-L-L-O-N. That's a good, that one looks good, yours looks great. Well, these, yeah, the, these are all, I try as best I can not to excerpt things, so many of these are complete writings. They're, I found a very rich trove of writings in the journalism that was uh, written during World War II. People like Ernie Pyle, Eric Severide, they were, they were up-and-coming journalists then. And they're, they're James Agee, the uh, fiction writer and film critic, as I put a little piece in here about uh, um, mo movie tone. Do you know what movie tones are? They, they were, uh, when you went to the movies a long time ago, uh, they would show little newsreels of world events, like they would show cartoons later. And, and he uh, reviewed a couple of those to just uh, uh, get an idea of how the media was, was covering the war. Because it was a time when um, news about wars was not as immediately available. It was distant. Thank you.